welcome to Talking with Jack. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, joined by Chris Bougay. Chris, how are you doing? Great. How are you, Rachel? So guess what, Rachel? You're not here just with me. I brought a special guest into the into the closet with me today to, to, um, to participate in this banter. Are you ready? I'm ready. I, you, the, the suspense has literally been killing me. Complete surprise. I didn't tell you this person was coming. So here's this person. Not only do you have Chris Bougay, but you also have Margaret Bougay, my daughter, who is also on the podcast. Hello. Hello, Maggie. So great to see you. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm so good. So I'm just so curious. Maggie, you're a special guest. What's going on? What do you have to tell our, our dear listeners? Um, I have spent a few days with a kid who uses lamp, and I wanted to talk about it. I love this. So you, how were you introduced to this kiddo that's using LAMP? Well, my mother worked at a school, and I go there because I have a camp afterwards that's right across the street. So I go, and then the mom asked me to just sit with him and watch movies. So I did, and I sat down, and I started watching a movie with him. And then I just realized he used lamp, and so I started using lamp with him. I love that. Oh, my goodness. This is a dream come true. So I'm sure you learned, did you learn all about lamp from your dad? Yeah, I learned before, but I didn't know he, like, used it a lot. I didn't know he used it to, like, actually fully talk. I thought he could, like, talk a little bit, just not fully depend on it. So what kinds of things were you guys talking about with each other? Well, he didn't talk a lot. I just kind of showed him some examples of stuff because he wasn't really, he didn't really know how to use it that well. We were watching the movie Bumblebee that had just come out. So I was like, car and fast and go and stuff like that and just showing him how to do it. That's exactly what we should be doing. We should be showing kids how to use their devices and modeling on that device, which it sounds like that's exactly what you were doing. So Maggie has some experience with um, LAMP because when we were first learning, when I was first learning it myself and, and just learning you know, how it was designed, um, I would sit with Maggie and I'd be like, okay, we're going to find this word. Let's try and find the word. And so she has seen me use it and we've talked about it and we talk about stuff over the years. Also, when I got stitches, they, when I took my stitches out, it was like right there, so I couldn't talk as much right as where? I wanted, like right on underneath my chin. Uh-huh. So I couldn't really talk or anything. So I used lamp to just talk for that night. It was fun. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Temporary AAC user. <laughs> but so then you had some experience about where the words are, and it made it a little easier to find. Oh yeah, the it, second day was much easier than the first. And we did do a little um, coaching session because I knew that um, Maggie was going to be having this experience with hanging out with this with this user of lamp. So we did talk about modeling just a little bit and some examples of, well, okay, if you're playing a game and here are some things you might say, and if you're watching a movie, then just describe what you're seeing in the movie, which is why you're like fast and yeah. car. And, hmm. The next day we watched Endgame, which was my favorite one. <laughs> so we were watching it and I kept modeling the words. And at the end, he started to talk a little bit more each day, which was fun. I just got to say, I'm so proud of you for not spoiling the movie. (laughs) (laughs) I try. I have one question for you. For people out there who might feel a little intimidated by LAMP and don't know how to use it, what's some advice that you would give them since now you're a sort of expert on LAMP? Well, I like to use Word Finder. If you go into the spell button, there's uh, also a button inside of the spell button that says Word Finder, and I would just type in the word, and then I would learn where it was. I love it. You hear that, people? Lamp is easy to use. Just use Word Finder. It's a great way to learn the sequences, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any uh, thing you do differently? Um, I would probably watch a different movie. Oh, really? Why is that? Um, Bumblebee made me cry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> These are important things, Chris. <laughs> so you could say sad. Yeah, I did. He did. It was fun. Well, cool, cool. And can, just out of curiosity, um, 
you spent some time with this particular boy, but had you ever used this with any other students ever in the past, any of your friends or um, anything? Once with my friend, we were using a, a robot called Dot, and we were doing it, and then I entered Lamp just to, like, play around with it because I was like, what's this? So I just put words in, and me and her just had fun with it. Oh, you mean, like, here around the house? Yeah, I mean, kind of. <laughs> She's not a lamp user or anything like that. No. Not like a friend at school who uses a communication app. Oh, yeah, that. I have done that with, like, I think two kids. One was a boy, one was a girl. They are both my age. Um, she walked up to me, and the teacher didn't know how to properly use lamps, so I said hi on her device. And the teacher was like, what the heck? And I was like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> she was really stunned that I knew how to do it. And then the boy, um, he just had gotten it like a day or two ago. And so I just modeled hello on it. Was he a lamp user too? Or was are we thinking of a boy that had a different app? He, no, he was a lamp user for like three days. <laughs> three days. He had just got, he had just yeah. received it. Yeah. Gotcha. So you just started modeling on that too. Mm -hmm. He said hello and just, just started chatting using yeah. that, that app. Awesome. Love it. Love it, Maggie. Thank you so much for coming on. This was such a pleasant surprise. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now you're going to be, you're going to be famous on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for um, having me. Could you just let everyone know that they should uh, check us out on the Facebook group where they can ask you questions directly and then uh, I'll, I'll filter through the answers if, you, if uh, they have questions for you? Exactly what he said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody go to our Facebook group, Talking With Tuck, and you can ask Maggie all the questions. Who cares about Chris or I? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Maggie, for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, that was amazing. I'm so excited about that special guest. Yeah, she's a lot of fun, and she it takes direction really well, and she has a lot of experience working with AAC, not just because she has a dad that has a bunch of apps on his iPad and she plays with them when her friends come over, you know, um, but because she's in schools with kids that use AAC. So, and I feel like that's becoming more and more prevalent, right? I mean, it's, here's a student in general ed that is going to be uh, surrounded by people who uh, have a disability, who are using AAC, and she's learning how to support them. And I feel like that's a good thing. And if Maggie can do it, anybody can. That's the way I see it. Like, and, you know, we should be supporting this both in siblings of children, you know, with complex communication needs and in schools with general ed students. This is how we really foster a sense of community and acceptance around AAC and awareness. Um, you know, and it's just so cool to hear about her experience. And she just shared it so eloquently, too. Yeah, she's a lot of fun. Well, thank you for bearing with me in that surprise. I was like, who is he going to bring on? I thought it was going to be Melissa, which I was also going to get really excited about. <laughs> but it was a different bouquet. We're going to have the whole family on. Tucker's next. <laughs> He's next. Yeah, the boy's next. He also has some experience. He, like I mentioned, when I was first learning LAMP for, in, in that specific app, I was sitting there uh, with her sometimes while we're waiting for Tucker to finish like a sporting event. And then sometimes while we're waiting for her to finish a sporting event, I would sit with Tucker. And so I'd be like, give me a word. And then I'd look at it and say, okay, where would this word be? You know, so I was trying to test myself so I wouldn't have to use the word finder just so I could try and figure out the logic of where words would be. And if you're not familiar with that system, if you're listening to this and you're like, watch, don't, don't worry about it. Just the idea that there are lots of words and there's usually a logic to all of the apps about where the words are located. And so I was trying to suss out what that logic was for myself without having to go to the search function, or in this case, the word finder function. And so, long story short, both kids have experience of, of helping their dad learn where the words are. I love it. And I think it's just like perfect because kids are so in tune with technology. I feel like they can pick up iPads and new apps and all these things, and they can just start using them right away. Where I think sometimes adults who didn't always have technology don't necessarily pick it up as quickly, but um, I just love it. I love it. And I'm really excited that she was able to share her experience and have that experience. Now, you know what else she could share? Maybe I should get her back in here is productivity hacks from a sixth grader. You know, how does she manage your life? <laughs> <laughs> that hard life a sixth grader leads. <laughs>
I'm sure she has all sorts of games and text messages, things that she get tricks that I don't know because, you know, I have gray in my beard now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you guys have all been waiting for part three of our productivity hacks. We presented part one and part two. We did a talk for AAC in the cloud, which is an online AAC conference. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to share all our hacks. So we promised on that webinar that we would share on the podcast. So we're finally doing it, people. We're finally getting to go through the rest of our presentation. So where we left off was with these two different tools that are Google Chrome extensions. And what they specifically are for is taking a screenshot. So the way I like to talk about this is, um, is this phenomenon that's, that students have. Um, Rachel, you know this, there's this other kind of tool. Maybe we should talk about this tool first that a lot of kids use nowadays, especially middle school kids. It's called Fortnite. Have you heard of Fortnite? I have heard yeah. of Fortnite. So I often think of Fortnite and video game and video game culture. And people use this this term that screenshot or it didn't happen, you know, which to me is sort of like the same thing as the old fisherman's tale, you know. Oh, it was this big, sure, it's, but it got away. The line broke, sure it did, sure it did. Well, that's what how video game culture uh, talks about this. Oh my gosh, I was able to accomplish this in six seconds, or I was able to get all these things. It's like. No, it didn't happen unless you take a screenshot. So kids today know this, this idea that you need to document your work. You know, just stories don't matter. You have to back it up with evidence and facts. And that's what, to me, Nimbus Screenshot and Screencastify allow you to do. They, they have multiple functions. The first one is to just allow you to take a screenshot of whatever's on your screen. I think I talked about in, in part one of this about using the snipping tool from Windows. That's another way you can take a screenshot. Shot. And then, of course, another way on a Windows machine, a lot of people don't know this, but if you hit the print screen button on your Windows computer, that also takes a screenshot. It's like hitting a, the copy button, how you copy text. Or if you hit print screen, it takes a, an entire screenshot of your entire screen of your, uh, of your computer. So did you just do it? Did I you just take a I screenshot did, of your Mac? I a screenshot. <laughs> I was just playing around on my Mac as you were talking about Windows. What was it? It was, it, it was Command Shift 3, in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> um, so Nimbus Screenshot and Screencastify, uh, they really come out of using Chromebooks, right? If you're a Chromebook user, if you have students that are using Chromebooks, that's another way to take a screenshot on any device, but or any device that has Google Chrome that you can use. So not only does it have the screenshot capability, but there's also a very similar to Loom. It's a way that you can capture a video of what's happening on your screen. So different tools. You had mentioned Loom earlier, that you're a fan of that. These are different options. If you haven't adopted one of these tools yet, you could try out the, the different features of, the, uh, of each of these tools and find the right one for you. And also, if you have an Apple device, now they have a feature where you can actually screen record your screen on your iPhone or your tablet, or I should say your iPad, um, which is really cool. It can be, you know, just part of the settings where, you know, you swipe up and there's the flashlight and the calculator and all those things. You can have a record button. So that's a really, really nice way to show where certain vocabulary is on a device, to send kind of quick little tutorial tips about how to utilize uh, a speech generating app that, you know, a student might be trialing or might be using and parents or teachers or other therapists have questions about it, if you just want to show that process, because we know that's the easiest way, right? All of the app companies have long blogs on how to change a button and all these things, but I find that just sending a minute or two video is way faster. And also you can share that with multiple clients. So I have a stockpile of video tutorials. Here's how to add a button on Proloquo. Here's how to use Vocabulary Builder on LAMP. All these things where I can kind of walk people through the process and it only takes me one time and then I can send it to whoever I need to send it to down the line. Over and over again and just as a throwback to a previous strategy if you were to put those in bit.ly they're really easy to if you can remember oh I'm just going to type that out bit.ly slash screenshot of blah 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 or whatever the tool is bit.ly is a nice way to keep those organized. Love it. So let's talk about slack which is a way to message it's kind of a Glorified text messaging, but it's on a computer, it's on a device, it's on tablet or iPad. Um, it's just a really great way to organize when you have lots of different team things going on. So I have lots of different Slack channels. 
So if you watch the AAC in the cloud, then you know about Slack because you had to join a Slack channel in order to access the chat uh, while the presentations were going on. And it's just a really useful tool. There's a lot of different ways that we can, can communicate through our phones and through our computers. There's Gchat and text message and Facebook message. Um, but I like Slack because you can set certain hours. So it's more geared towards work. You know, I made the mistake of always allowing text messages, you know, when I was communicating with team members about work things. But then what happens is people send you messages at 9 p.m. when you don't want to be working. Um, so it's just a really good way to kind of differentiate your personal versus your work life. And you can set a lot of, you know, parameters around when you want to get notified and when you're working and when you're not working and away messages and things like that. So uh, it's a really great way to organize all that communication between teams. I love it. That's a great, great strategy. So similar to Slack, but not exactly the same. Again, uh, two different tools that are for some of the same functions is Trello. So Trello is something we used for a little while. We uh, ended up moving away to it and we went to Slack. But it is something that a lot of teams are using to collaborate on projects. So the way Trello works is that it's listed in columns let's say on the left-hand side of your screen, you might put the first column of the first objectives you want to accomplish in a project, you know. And then the next column is once they move from, from that phase of the project to the next phase, you just drag that aspect over to the right. And you progressively move things to the right across the screen until they're done with the project, until you eventually get to the, the done column, right? And it's a great way to organize what you want to get done. So for instance, when we were using it for the podcast, we would put a list of people that we wanted to interview in the first column. And then we would move, let's say we had... Um, Vicki Clark. Vicki Clark. She just came to me. Came to me in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> let's say we, we... So the next thing is we contacted Vicki Clark. So we would move Vicki Clark out of the idea column over to the contacted column. And then once uh, Vicki Clark wrote us back and said, yes, I'd love to come on the podcast, we'd move her to the scheduled column. And then after we recorded, we put her in the recorded column. And then once it was posted, we put her in the posted column. And just like that, you could move through your project of keeping track of where we are with that particular interview. And so that same sort of project and that same sort of workflow happens for any goal that you're trying to reach, any other project that has some sort of final product that you're making. I think this could be especially useful now that it's the beginning of the year, right? All of these clinicians are going back to school, starting with new kids. And I like to have a very set process as to what happens when I start working with a new child. You know, get the new child, print out a goal sheet, um, review IEP, contact family, talk with teacher, all these things you can kind of set out and then you can go through that workflow and know, you know, for this student, I'm here for this other student, you know, maybe I'm at the beginning of the process, but it's a way to kind of keep track because I don't know about you, Chris, but I definitely lose track of things that I'm supposed to be doing and at what point in the process I am. And so it's really nice having those workflows, especially if you're collaborating within a team. Love it. What a great practical strategy. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome. Yeah, because I was totally thinking of it as to work together as a group. Of what a way to just a great way to organize yourself and your clients. That's fantastic. Okay, so let me ask you. Tell us about Voxer. So that's something I have played with in the past, but I don't use it on a even on a weekly basis. Tell me more about it. I'm obsessed with it, Chris. It might be my favorite out of all of these hacks, which is really? a really bold statement because I like a lot of these hacks, especially Loom, but. And Acuity, actually, for scheduling calls and those things that I don't want to have to go back and forth with people on. So Voxer is essentially a walkie-talkie app. So that's the way you want to think about it. It's a way to send audio messages. And the reason I like it is because sometimes it just makes more sense to pick up the phone, but we can't pick up the phone all the time, right? I feel like it's so hard to get people on the phone these days. So what's nice about it is that I can send a message and I can communicate what I need very quickly on the fly. I'm constantly, you know, either walking or at my desk. I just pick up my phone really quickly and I send an audio message. It also allows for uh, recording a video. Um, you can send a picture. You can text message in it. But I think it's a really great way to just quickly communicate about clients. I use it with all of my clinicians that work for me. Actually, everybody that works for me uses Voxer because we're able to communicate very quickly and efficiently. 
say one of my clinicians um, has a question, instead of sending me an email or trying to organize a phone call, all these things take time, right? She can quickly just send me a Voxer and say, hey, you know, so-and-so is having a hard time with fill in the blank. Do you have any ideas? And I'll hop on really quickly and say, oh, have you tried this? It, it's a conversation, but it doesn't have to be a phone call because we all know how hard they are to schedule. So I just love Voxer and use it with all of my team members. And it's just such a quick way to talk with one another, um, you know, instead of writing it out in an email or trying to find a time to talk. I love that. So uh, the way I've used it in the past too, and tell me if this is still the case with Voxer, because like I said, I haven't used it in a, in a little while, um, is that it, it was great for professional development, meaning there are like groups that you could join and you could listen to people having conversations back and forth, sort of like reading. Uh, if you were to go to our Facebook group and you were to read the comments, but they'd be in audio format, right? And people are going back and forth having conversations. It, it's sort of like a podcast in that way. Am I thinking of it right? Yes. And the only reason I know about this feature is because somehow I was added to a group and I kept getting notifications and listening to these conversations and I had no idea what was going on. And I, I have no idea to this day how I was added. I ended up blocking the group. And, but I do know that's a capacity. I, don't use, I only use it internally within my team. But um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of options with it. And as I mentioned, you also can use it for video. Um, you can only send short videos. I think it's like 10 or 15 seconds. Um, you can send pictures, you can text. Um, so if you know, you're in a place where you can't actually vox her back, but you can text, it's still, you can use all different forms of communication. Awesome. All right. So the next tool that, uh, that I have used for years now is something called IFTTT, if this, then that. And it's a way of streamlining your, really all your whole digital experience, your whole life, uh, your social media, all sorts of things. So the way it works is, um, a series of, uh, I guess they're called applets, and they connect two different tools together. So for instance, I'm going to give you some examples of two different tools that I have uh, that are connected together. Um, one is connecting Twitter to a Google spreadsheet so that whenever I favorite a, like like something on Twitter, it, the, the little applet that I have says, save URLs in favorited tweets to a Google spreadsheet. So every time I'm, I'm on Twitter and I see someone post something and it's got like a, a hyperlink to a resource, I might not have time to check it out right now or I want to keep it someplace. I just hit the little heart button, right, or the like button, and it automatically takes, if it has a URL in that tweet, it puts that tweet and that URL in a spreadsheet that I can go back and check later in a Google spreadsheet, it puts it all there, so then I can go through and just look at my list of Google spreadsheet and see all the hyperlinks so that I can see all the resources. And I, have to go, I don't have to go back to my Twitter and siphon through all the people that I was just liking what they said. And sometimes when you're on Twitter and you can like what people say, but sometimes you like things because you want to go back to it. This, is, this gives me a way to just streamline what I'm going back to. That's just one example of how to use it. There's other uh, different, there's tons of different tools that you can connect together so that if something happens in one tool, it then happens, this other thing happens in another tool. Another example is you can dictate a voice memo and it'll email a transcript and MP3 file to yourself. So lots of different options here. Uh, I, I could go on and on. One of them I have that's not really productivity, Rachel, is... Um, we have our uh, Alexa hooked to it. So it keeps a list of all the songs ever played in uh, Alexa. So we can go back like, what was that song? What was it? Oh, and it, and, it, and it has who the artists were. So not really productivity for work, but just a fun one to have too. No, I love that. I love that. Actually, is that uh, free, Chris? It is, it is free. Yep, it is to totally free. So there's a paid version of this called Zapier. Have you heard of Zapier? No. So Zapier essentially is the same thing. I think it has over 1,500 apps that it integrates and it does exactly that. So say I can set it up so that when somebody submits an intake form for me on my website or on Google or whatever, then it sends an automatic email to them saying, you know, thank you so much for, you know, your interest in speech therapy. Here are the next steps. Um, and you can do that with literally anything. But you only get one zap, they're called zaps, you only get one zap for free, and then you have to pay for it. So I love this idea of not having to pay. Yeah, definitely check it out. See if there's different applets that would work for you and the different tools that you use. 
I love this. Applets, zaps. They're so cute. Let's talk about how to coordinate meetings because that's one of the hardest things, especially these IEP teams that you have that have like 25 people on them. I know you guys know what I'm talking about because we all work with complex communication needs. So everyone has two OTs, two speech therapists, um, the whole team. It's really hard organizing you know, availability. And so one of the websites that I use a lot is called Doodle. And Doodle allows you to set times, timeframes in which you could potentially have a meeting and then people fill in their availability. And you can very easily see across a visual spreadsheet who has what available. And you can see, you know, this one day at this one time has the most availability. This is the one we're going to go with. Um, Instead of trying to email everybody and ask for their availability, it just takes a lot of brain power. Um, So Doodle is so amazing at coordinating. Um, I use it both professionally and when I'm trying to like get my friends together. I'm like, I'm just going to send a Doodle because we all know how hard it is to get together for a girls night. Um, So it's just, it's, it's, I use it across, you know, every area of my life. You know, we use Doodle this summer. Uh, I also use it all the time. But specifically this summer, we were trying to put some days together, get, find days for, I think there was 13 of us trying to get together to do some uh, training. Like we were going to put together our workshops that we we're doing for this upcoming school year. And so we were doing it over the summer and we got, you know, some people go to the, like I went to a lake and other people, everyone's on vacation. We had to say, okay, the chances are of getting everybody on the same two days is very slim. So majority rules, let's do a doodle, put all the days that you're available. And then we just took the, the one that worked out the best for everybody. Love it. Yes. There's no reason. Every time I get, because I'll still get an email from somebody asking for my availability for a team meeting. And I just send like a, a friendly public service announcement at the bottom. Like, have you ever used Doodle? It's, it's so easy. Like no more headache for scheduling. And so many people have responded and said, oh my gosh, this is a game changer. I'm like, you're welcome. Yeah, well, so let me ask you this, because you had mentioned previously about Calendly, and ironically enough, I just came from a meeting, Rachel, where um, one of the people in, the, in our meeting, she said, well, I use Calendly all the time, and other people are like, well, what's that? So she got up and she did maybe a 10-minute presentation on what Calendly was and how she uses it, um, but you had mentioned this previously. When do you use a doodle versus Calendly? So I use a doodle when it's a group. So that for me, the value in Doodle is when it's a bunch of people and you're trying to coordinate availability. Um, when it's somebody who just needs to talk with me, you know, privately about a student or touching base with parents, um, then I'll just have them, I'll send my schedule and they can book a call, um, either a video call or a phone call or an appointment. You can do it with a, literally anything. Um, and what's really nice if you have the paid version of either Calendly or Acuity, they both do the same thing. Um, It integrates with your calendar, it integrates with Google, so it knows when I'm available. So if I add an appointment to my Google calendar and I say, oh, I'm actually gonna see this kid from one to two, it automatically takes it off my availability for my, uh, my Acuity. So somebody can't book a call for me. Um, And it does it pretty quickly. Like I just had my uh, assistant update my calendar and I just checked because I sent out a, a link saying like, book a call because that's my move. I use a canned response, which we talked about in our other, uh, in our other episode, uh, which is just a um, way to save email responses and especially links. And so anyway, I use a canned response sending to this parent to book an AAC consultation. And I thought, oh, wait, we were just going back and forth with a lot of different people about my schedule for next week. Let me just make sure um, you know, that it's showing up because the worst thing that happens with these automations is that you double book yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But it, automa- it automatically updates really quickly. So sure enough, it was fine. And all of those new appointments were on there and accounted for. So it's just mm-hmm. um, makes things so much easier. One of the features that she was showing today about Calendly was the idea, she said, well, it's possible that people would go on, click on my link, and then try and schedule something like from an hour from now. You know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm busy right now. It might look like I'm not busy right now, but I can't just hop in the car and be there in an hour. 
uh, or, or at your whim. But she said there's settings where you can go in and say, okay, it has to be this far out, right? Yeah, that happens to me. So I have it set, I think it's 24 hours in advance uh, to book because I have it set up for my office appointments. So I have set office hours and some of them are set. I see the same kids at the same times every week, but because I do a lot of consultation for AAC stuff, um, I have a lot of availability for families who just want to book a session once a month or every other week. And it's happened where, you know, I'll be sitting at my desk and then all of a sudden I'll get an email and I'll be seeing somebody tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, and I'm excited, but I'm also like, oh man, I thought I was done at four yesterday or I thought I was done at four tomorrow, but now I'm not. <laughs> so, um, but yes, you can absolutely set the settings um, to be whatever you want. People can book, you know, no more than a week in advance, two weeks. Um, so yeah, it's really cool how you can kind of change the parameters for that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, okay. I think we're coming to an end here. Uh, there's only one other hack that I wanted to talk about, which is really, I mean, there's plenty of others. And I think we could do a whole nother episode on uh, uh, additional productivity hacks, but no promises right now because we got other AAC stuff specific to, to talk about. But I did have one other thing to share and not to advertise someone else's podcast, but one way that I've learned about productivity hacks is um, from the Get It Done Guy podcast. It has short podcast episodes with all sorts of productivity hacks. That's what the each episode is about, is about uh, just making things, making your life, really squeezing every minute out of your life. And podcasts are a great way to do that. If you're going to learn more, that might be a podcast to check out. I also have one more thing that I want to add because I think it'll be really cool. So I just started using I don't know if you pronounce these GIFs or GIFs. I think everybody pronounces them different. G-I-F. I've been using these in my practice and it's been a game changer. If you don't know what it is, it's essentially a photo that you can find. Um, there's lots of different apps. The one I use is called Giphy or Jiffy. I don't really know how to pronounce it. Um, but With a P-H, right? With G -I -P -H -Y. It's with a P -H -Y. Yes, G-I-P-H-Y. And so you can search. So say I'm working on... Um, I'm working on more abstract verbs with a child. Um, so they have like the really concrete ones like eating and drinking and jumping and running. Um, but taking, for example, that's one that is a little bit harder to teach. It's a little more abstract. And so I can search taking on this, uh, this Giphy app and I can download the video and then I can show that. So instead of um, using a static flashcard for verbs, which I mean... I feel like we all can relate to it at some level. I used to do that years ago. Uh, but now with technology, we don't have to show a static image of a verb. We can show an action, right? A verb is an action. And so being able to show these um, is really cool. Also, it's really motivating. Kids love these. You can find super silly ones too. Uh, my biggest concern when I work with kids with autism is that they're just going to memorize, you know, he is eating an apple, right? Which is, I feel like every set of flashcards for verbs has a child eating an apple. Um, but it's so cool because with Giphy and these GIFs or GIFs, you can use, um, you know, you can have a cat eating something random or some type of animal doing something funny. Um, and so it really uh, encourages spontaneous language um, and novel, right? That's what we want. We want kids to be able to look at something novel and see what comes out of them, you know, especially kids with autism who are really good at memorizing. All right. I feel like it's a challenge coming up, Rachel. We should ask the listeners can you find a Giphy for a core vocabulary word? And can you find a GIF and post it to the Facebook group? A different core vocabulary. If someone already posted one for that particular word, you got to find a different word. Let's see how many different core vocabulary words we can get represented through a GIF using Giphy or any other GIF generating tool. So let's see how many different core vocabulary words we can represent through the Giphy app. And what's really nice is that you can create a album in your phone with all of these pictures. And so I have one with my clinicians and we keep adding to it. It's a shared iPhoto album. And so anytime like, you know, one of them gets a really funny one or a good one, we add it to the folder. Um, and so it's something that you can do with your team. And it's just really fun too, because you can find really, really funny ones. You're not going to find that productivity hack in the Get It Done Guy podcast. <laughs> nope, definitely not. You know, one more thing about it that I feel like why it's so useful is that we, when we communicate, we communicate because things are interesting or silly or weird, you know, and I feel like we need to take that into account when we're thinking about children, 
um, you know, what's going to motivate them to communicate? Is it going to be some boy eating an apple or is it going to be, you know, some random elephant doing something crazy? Like that's what they want to communicate about because that's interesting and novel and, you know, weird. And weird and funny. Yeah. I could not agree more. I, I use, I use Giphy all the time, not in therapy because, you know, I'm not working directly that way, but uh, in text messages and it just makes it more fun, right? Exactly. And that's the goal. So if you guys haven't already, please join our Facebook group. I'm all about this gift challenge. We'll have to post something on there and have everybody comment with their favorite gifts. And then we can all save those to our phones and we can have an amazing album full of gifts that we can use in therapy. This sounds like a great idea, right, Chris? I think it's going to be awesome. And I think our listeners are up to it. Awesome. Well, for Talking With Tech, I'm so excited that you guys listened today. I hope you got a lot out of this. For Chris Bougain and I, thank you guys so much for listening. And we will talk to you guys next week. Please listen carefully. Hi, I'm Matt Hott, one of the hosts of Speech Science, a weekly podcast bringing you all the information that you can handle related to speech sciences and disabilities. Michelle Wintering, Michael McLeod, and I interview leaders and difference makers in the field. Every Tuesday, we drop a new episode. You can find us on iTunes, Android, and on our website, www.speechscience.org slash speech science podcast. Join us as we try to find the answers to the question. What is communication? You're listening to the Exceptional Podcast Network.